Hi, this is Theory Station. I'm John Duggan, and this is the Rational Choice Modeling Program. Uh, the series we're in is called Individual and Social Choice. This is the first installment of the series, and um, this installment is going to be called uh, Properties of Preferences. So, um, I'm just, I'm just going to start talking about the, uh, the basic rational choice model where we have a set of alternatives or possible choices. I'll just call them alternatives. I'm used to that. Um, this set uh, is very general. It's, it's, it's an abstract model. You can think of it as just a finite set of choices. Um, it could be an interval on the real line. It could be, you know, a subset of multi-dimensional space. Um, right now, we're not committing to anything. So, uh, so one of the the first building block is the set of alternatives. The second building block is um, a preference relation. This capital P. Um, this is going to represent what I call strict preference. Um, formally speaking, this is a binary relation on the set of alternatives. Um, but you can just think of it intuitively as a list of preferences. Obviously, if there's an infinite number of alternatives, it's not really a list. But the point is that um, it's, uh, it's the second building block of the model and um, obviously you need this to, to think about rational choice. That is choice um, that's directed toward, you know, obtaining the best possible outcome. So the way we're going to use this notation is um, whenever one alternative is better than another, so let's say one alternative is little x, the other alternative is little y, Whenever one alternative is, is better than another, we'll use this expression. Um, we'll write x, p, y. Okay. And as I said, this means x is strictly better or strictly preferred to y by the decision maker. Um, we have talked about uh, the idea of a utility function. We'll get to that um, fairly soon. But what I want to do is dig into this uh, concept of preference relation in more detail than I covered in the, uh, the basic formal theory toolkit. So um, intuitively, we want to think about this decision maker as having some ranking of alternatives. Okay. Um, so that these binary comparisons kind of make sense. Um, one possibility, let's say, if our set of alternatives contains just five alternatives, um, you might have A at the top, and then B and C would be tied for second place in the ranking, D and E would be tied for last place. Um, and so here, we would say that A is preferred to B, it's preferred to C, it's preferred to D and E, B is preferred to D, it's preferred to E, C as well, preferred to D and E. And that would be the list of uh, preferences in this example. Okay. Um, I want to instead of writing out this list um, in examples like this, I want to uh, sort of draw preferences. And the way I'm going to do that is with something called a directed graph. But really, the idea is quite simple. Um, I'm going to draw a dot for each alternative. OK. And I'm going to label them A, B, C, and D. A, B, C, D, and E. OK. Uh, Technically, we're going to call these things nodes. Okay, so in our directed graph, we have nodes. 
the other thing that we need is to, um, to depict these preferences, we're going to use arrows or arcs. So to represent the strict preference for A over B, I'm going to draw an arrow or arc from A to B. There's a strict preference for A over C as well, and one for A over D and A over E. Okay, we have all these other strict preferences. Okay, so that's just a little bit easier than writing it all out and um, visually, um, I think it helps think about relations and properties of relations. So, um, so this would be the directed graph that corresponds to the ranking here in this example. Um, all right, now I said intuitively we, we want to think about this decision maker as having a ranking. Let's be more formal about that. The way I'm going to express this idea formally is to define uh, properties of this relation, of the preference relation. Um, so let me start off with, uh, well, I'll give three properties that a strict preference relation could have. Uh, one is called asymmetry. And the way we define this property is we say uh, for any possible choices, let's say X and Y, um, and let me use this notation Right, so little x and little y are possible choices, so they're elements of the big set x, the big x. Um, and this curly E here just means they're elements of that set. Okay. So for all possible choices, x and y, if x is strictly better than y, then it's not the case that y is strictly better than x. That's super intuitive. Um, introspection will automatically tell you if you prefer one thing to another, then you don't prefer the second thing to the first. So, um, you know, that is a very intuitive property, easy, called asymmetry. Okay. Um, another and although I, I, I don't really want to use logical no notation too much, I should just note that um, this, uh, this bit that I've underlined here, this is called a conditional statement. Okay, If one thing, then another. Um, we can write that using logical notation like so. Oh, I don't want to say not. YPX. Okay, so this um, this sort of double arrow here is used to represent a logical conditional. Okay, um, the thing on the left here is called the antecedent of the conditional, and the thing on the right is called the consequent. Okay, one more bit of notation: instead of writing not, um, some notation that we could use is this little angled um, uh, object here. Um, that means not the case that, all right? So if X is strictly preferred to Y, then it's not the case that Y is strictly preferred to X. All right, that's just an aside. Let's think more about properties of P. So um, another one that's pretty intuitive is called transitivity. And this says for any three possible choices, x, y, and let's say z, if x is preferred to y and y is preferred to z, then x is preferred to z. Okay, and if you think about a ranking, 
this is really intuitive. If x is above y in the ranking, here, if x is above y in the ranking and y is above z, then x is above z too. That's all this says, okay? Um, again, this is a logical conditional, and um, we can write that like so, xpy and ypz implies xpz. However, um, when you're writing things out like this in English, sometimes the syntax isn't totally clear. Um, this could look like I'm saying that x is better than y, and I'm stating this conditional statement that if y is better than z, then x is better than z. Well, I don't want to do that. I want to say if both x is preferred to y and y is preferred to z, then x is preferred to z. Um, a little more logical notation instead of and, we can use this another angled symbol. Um, but this one is like an upside down V that stands for a conjunction. Okay. So, um, so that's sort of the logical way of expressing this conditional statement. And, um, since I'm doing digressions today, let me also mention, um, that instead of writing this conditional statement, Oftentimes what's done is we write x, p, y, p, z. So we're kind of jamming these two um, binary comparisons together into one string. Um, but that just means the same thing as x is preferred to y and y is preferred to z. Okay, Just some shorthand that we use. Okay, I promised uh, three properties. So we have asymmetry, transitivity, and um, the next one might seem less intuitive at first, and certainly the, the name is not intuitive. It's called negative transitivity. And um, I'll state this for you, but I'll explain it, and it's actually more intuitive than you think. All right. So as with transitivity, this is going to hold for all, uh, for any three possible choices. Um, and we're gonna say this, if X is preferred to Y, then either uh, X is preferred to Z or z is preferred to y. All right, so probably the first time you look at that, it's not really that obvious why this is interesting. Um, let me just uh, do the logical translation of this. Um, this again is a conditional statement, and um, here the antecedent is x preferred to y. Right. If x is preferred to y, then either x is preferred to z or z is preferred to y. Notice that I've the consequent now is a disjunction, and I'm putting that into brackets so that the syntax is clear. And um, one more little bit of notation. Instead of saying or like this, we can use this angled notation, it looks just like a V. So um, we have the logical conditional, we have the negation symbol, conjunction, and this is called disjunction, okay? It means at least one of those two things is true. Okay, so let's, uh, let's just talk about why negative transitivity is, um, is actually kind of an intuitive property. Okay, so again, negative transitivity for all x, y, and z. 
if x is preferred to y, then either x is preferred to z or z is preferred to y. Okay, so imagine a decision maker who has some ranking of alternatives. Okay, um, let's just uh, let's put it here. So let's just put it here. Uh, here's our ranking. Just imagine the alternatives are in here in some order. So according to the antecedent here, x is preferred to y. So that means that x is above y in the ranking. Okay. So now we have some other alternative z. Um, well, if you think about it, uh, either z is below x or it's weakly above x. Okay, that is either z is strictly below x in the ranking, which is this part here, or it's tied or above x in the ranking. Those are the two possible cases, right? Um, so if z is down here, if it's below x in the ranking, then x is preferred to z. If z is up here, well, it's either at the same level as x or it's above x, in, in you know, regardless, it's above y, it's above y in the ranking, so z is preferred to y. So if you just think about it in terms of a ranking, you can see how, um, how this property or, uh, of preferences really arises naturally in the rational choice setting, okay? Um, so uh, I want to say a little bit more about these properties. I think I can squeeze it in this installment. Um, so let me say that um, the key assumption for us in this rational choice setup is that the strict preference relation is asymmetric and negatively transitive. Okay, it turns out that um, those two properties mean that this strict preference relation um, really is a ranking of the alternatives. Okay, so this is an important assumption that we will make whenever we're talking about an individual decision maker. Um, we're going to assume this intuitively. It just means that the strict preference relation is a ranking of alternatives. Um, and I'm not going to really repeat it every time we use it. We're just going to assume that. Okay. You might be thinking, that's weird. Transitivity seems like a completely compelling property. I mean, if you're a rational decision maker, in fact, let's just do it over here. Suppose x is above y um, and y is above z. Well, clearly, x is above z, right? So just from inspection of this, this ranking, we can see that if x is above y and y is above z, then x is above z. Um, so transitivity is something that we want to assume too, right? It turns out that, um, that transitivity is redundant because it's actually implied by the conjunction of the first two properties. So if a strict preference relation is asymmetric and negatively transitive, then it's transitive. So let's just prove that and then that'll be the end of this installment. So um, I'll call this a proposition. If P is asymmetric, and negatively transitive, then it's transitive. Okay, 
So um, this is, uh, you know, we're kind of jumping in here um, with both feet, but what we've done is, you know, we started with this simple model and then we define these ideas, right? We, we had a set of alternatives, we have a preference relation, and then we define concepts in this informal in way, these uh, properties, asymmetry, transitivity, negative transitivity. And once we have those, and those correspond to something in the real world, right? The idea that someone can rank alternatives. Once we have that structure to start playing around with, we can then, you know, start making deductions um, using logical methods. And so let's just go ahead and do that here. Let's actually prove this proposition. Um, now, I'm not really, I'm not going to go into, uh, you know, you could take a whole class on how to do logical proofs. We're going to kind of learn by doing here. So the way we're going to prove this proposition is the following. We're going to, um, well, we want to show that if P is asymmetric and negatively transitive, then it's transitive. So let's, um, let's suppose that we have a strict preference relation that's asymmetric and negatively transitive. I won't write out all of those letters, but um, right, we want to show that in case the strict pre preference relation does satisfy those, we want to show that it's transitive. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, IE, that is, um, it means for all X, Y, and Z, if X is preferred to Y and Y is preferred to Z, then X is preferred to Z, okay? All right, so that's what I need to show. How do I show a statement like this? Notice the syntax of this statement is, um, you know, it's basically a conditional statement, um, but we're saying it holds for all x, y, and z. Okay, so this is called um, a universal statement because uh, we're saying that something holds for all elements of a set. In this case, it's for all triples of alternatives. But we're basically saying um, we're saying this conditional holds, this conditional statement holds for all choices of x, y, and z. So the way we prove that is we're going to um, let's think about there being a bag full of all the alternatives. We're just going to pull three of them out at random without knowing exactly which is which now. And we're going to just pull them out like this. We're going to say, well, let's just consider any three alternatives. We don't know which ones they are, but for the purposes of this proof, let's just give them names. Let's say, let's call them um, A, B, and C. Okay? All right. So I've now just entered a proof of this universal statement. And what is it I have to prove? Well, it's this highlighted conditional statement, right? I need to show that if one is preferred to the, uh, the second and the second is preferred to the third, then the first is preferred to the third. The way you prove a logical conditional is, well, you suppose that we've selected, let's suppose we've selected three alternatives, A, B, and C, for which the antecedent holds. Okay, let's suppose that A is preferred to B and B is preferred to C. Okay, well, what we need to show then is that A is preferred to C. Okay, um, the whole you know, point of a conditional statement 
is that when the antecedent holds, the consequent has to hold. Here, we're supposing that we have three alternatives for which the antecedent holds. We need to show the consequent holds. All right, well, that's a lot of work, but we haven't really even started the proof yet, okay? So right now, that's just kind of logical boilerplate, and we have to um, now start proving something, all right? We have our supposition. We're supposing A is preferred to B, B is preferred to C. How do we actually get to this conclusion that we want? Well, that's where um, our assumption comes into play. We are assuming that P is asymmetric, and we're assuming it's natively transitive, right? We're going to have to use those two properties now to get from this uh, supposed antecedent to the desired consequent. Okay. So, um, all right. Of course, A is preferred to B, right? Well, um, if we're going to graph that, we would draw an arc from A to B. By negative transitivity, um, we either have um, A is preferred to C or C is preferred to B. Okay, the blue case and the red or in the red case. By negative transitivity, at least one of those has to happen. Okay, um, let me just write that out. Oops, or C is preferred to B. Well, obviously, the first case is what we want to get to. We want to show A is preferred to C. We're going to do that by showing that the second case can't hold. All right, well, how do we do that? We're going to show that um, that, that leads to a contradiction, right? And it's just right, right away. Note that um, in, in the second case, let me just write that out. Right. In the second case, we have C is preferred to B. But remember, we're assuming here that B is preferred to C, okay? We're thinking about the hypothetical scenario where we've picked out three alternatives from this bag and A is preferred to B, B is preferred to C. But look, we have C preferred to B and B preferred to C. We said that that can't happen, right? Formally speaking, it violates the assumption of asymmetry. Okay, so we've ruled out that case. What we're left is what left with is A is preferred to B. Uh, A is preferred to C, sorry. Okay, um, that's really a lot of detail. This is a very uh, simple thing to prove if you think about it, but if you unpack the whole proof, that's really what it looks like, okay? Um, we're not going to prove things in this much detail all the time, but um, but that's how you prove this. Uh, it's a basic um, uh, kind of observation from our rational choice setup here. Um, if, if preferences are asymmetric and negatively transitive, then they're transitive. Okay, uh, last, very last thing. Um, we're going to define um, a concept here. We're going to say P is a weak order if 
it's asymmetric and negatively transitive. Okay, so this is just uh, some terminology that we'll use um, just so I don't have to say asymmetric and negatively transitive all the time. Um, so obviously our proposition then is any weak order is transitive. Okay, all right, so we got into the weeds a little bit. Um, we're going to stay kind of in the weeds and um, think about uh, more details of, of, these, of a preference relation. Um, and anyway, so that's what's coming up in the next installment, and I'll see you there.